Hello, thank you for attending. Yeah, first DEF CON, everything's impressive. The uh, size of the room is also impressive. Um, so we are Paul and Thomas, who are two volunteer researchers from the Sonar R&D team. Paul, do you? Hi, I'm Paul, and yeah, I come from the CTF scene, and in general, I like to break JavaScript things, so VS Code is a very good place for that. And uh, on my side, I'm more like a PHP guy. It's been giving me a job in the offensive security side for like six years. I hope it's going to keep on, keep on giving for the next decade. And I uh, also, like also like to do some exploration in the uh, memory and safety world from time to time. And uh, our company, Sonar, uh, writes static analysis tools to help developers to write clean code. And uh, it's like a sp spell checker, but for code in general. And uh, we use uh, zero days that we find ourselves to fuel product innovation. We found more than 150 zero days over the last two years. And we were recognized by nomination for the Pony Awards, uh, the Ports Trigger Top 10 Web Booking Techniques. And we also play Pont1 from time to time. And because the journey of most developers starts in the code editor, we are wondering about the security of these code editors. And everybody has usually strong opinions on their favorite code editor. Like Paul likes Nano, which is weird, don't tell me, but it's like 8% of all developers pretend to use Nano for some reasons. Uh, but sometimes you need to get, to, get, to get the job done and you start using bigger IDs like Visual Studio or the NTDJ Suite or VS Code, which is the most popular one with like 75% of the market share. So let's start to do something a bit interactive with VS Code. Uh, you've been cloning some Git repo online or somebody just sent you some source code and you want to open it in VS Code because, I mean, it's your job as a developer to read and edit code. Um, so please raise your hand if you think that nothing wrong is going to happen. So next slide, the conclusion, and talk is over. Nobody, right? Uh, OK, yeah, maybe. And raise your hand if you think something bad may happen in this context. OK, so some people are not sure. So I'm going to show you a quick demo uh, to show you that it's real. Uh, so we just received something. Oh, sorry. Maybe I can zoom in a bit. Yeah, OK. Um, so you just received something, or you just get cloned something on your desktop. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, open me, please. Just like some HTML file I, with a Git repo, nothing sensitive. So I go on VS Code, I open my folder, I get this security prompt popping, but it's calc before this prompt. I didn't do anything. So something's fishy, and we're going to get back on it uh, later. But it's definitely unsafe to do some things with VS Code. And uh, this is what we want to show you today. It's uh, what's wrong. We, there is no standard threat model for developer tools. We don't know what's unsafe. And before doing this research, uh, when we found this thing, we were kind of surprised. Is it a normal thing to do? Like, is it supposed to be unsafe to read somebody else's code? Because, I mean, it's my job. And every day I just open random people's PHP code that I find online. So if I do it, is, does it weaken the secret of my system? Uh, can I open somebody else's code without any risk? Uh, does my IDE run my code? It just happened with GEB decompiler. Uh, that's used by malware analysts. But in practice, like in, in the background, it would run the code you would decompile, which is not something nobody wants, I guess. Um, and also, when you have fancy features like VS Code's remote development, do you know if it's safe? Microsoft doesn't say really anything uh, on this regard. And also, I think some background is uh, that we have more and more threat actors campaigns against developers. Uh, I would be a threat actor. I would try to target developers. I, it would be an easy target. Uh, they do plenty of things all, all day with everybody else's code, uh, with dependencies and stuff. And recently, we've been seeing uh, threat actors using uh, Plex one day uh, in the last pass campaign. So they compromised uh, DevOps uh, through their Plex uh, media server instance. And then I think they use some keylogger to get secrets to access production. And they compromise everybody's password vault that way. Uh, there were also a uh, Google tag, so the threat analyst group. They reported uh, a North Korean campaign. Uh, oh, say, say it's North Korea. Uh, and somebody would reach out to some prominent InfoSec figures on Twitter and say, oh, yeah, I have this kind of exploit. I, I can build it. Can you help me to do it? And you, when you're nice and talented, citizen, you're like, yeah, I'm going to help you. And if you build a project, it would compromise you and run some uh, weird PowerShell things in the background. Um, so it's definitely a thing. And with this presentation, we want to show you around the different attack surfaces of these IDEs, including VS Code. Oh, it's going to be about VS Code anyway. Uh, Paul will start by showing you how the software is architectured. You will see it's a huge beast, so uh, it needs some background understanding on how it works and how it's developed and designed. And then we can start by uh, looking at the most common sources of risk that we've seen in VS Code um, in the core and popular plugins. 
and it's based on own research, so we will tell you when it's all on bugs, and also some uh, research done by external researchers, and we'll credit them every time accordingly. And uh, then we will uh, look at the uh, reporting process from Microsoft. We have a fun anecdote to share. And most of the bug you will see requires some degree of interaction. Like you've seen, I've just opened a folder in uh, my desktop, and I think it's expected from VS Code. So we still call everything RCE uh, because the attacker is remote, but it would be more like something like arbitrary code execution uh, that's done by somebody who's remote, but that's being carried on locally. So we call it RCE, ACE, it's roughly the same thing in this context. Uh, so, Paul? Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's look at how VS Code is built. First of all, it's based on Electron, which is basically Node.js and Chromium mashed together. Uh, so it's written in TypeScript and with a little bit of HTML, CSS, and all the other web technologies sprinkled on top, which means it can also easily work in the browser. So there are two uh, web-based versions of VS Code, probably even more, uh, on github.dev and vscode.dev, and they are basically the same experience. Some things are different, but yeah, that's the gist of it. Uh, VS Code is highly extensible. Everybody can build extensions for it, and you can also publish them to the marketplace where everybody can install them from and search through them. And one cool thing that came up during the development of Visual Studio Code was the language server protocol. It's basically a way how you can write support for a language once, and then all editors that support this protocol can reuse it instead of having to code it for every editor again. Uh, VS Code is mostly open source. It has about 800,000 lines of code in its GitHub repo. Uh, and when you download the version from Microsoft directly, it has some small proprietary parts, uh, but you can also download the full OSS version if you want. Let's look at the components that VS Code is made of. So first of all, it isolates and splits different things into different components. And it uses processes for that. Um, and there are some privileged processes. You can see them in red. There's, first of all, the main process. This is the one that starts up first and orchestrates everything else. Then there's the shared process. This one hosts the PTYs, the terminals that you can open in VS Code, for example. It hosts the file watcher daemon and other utilities. And then there's the extension host process. And this one, as the name says, uh, hosts whatever extensions want to run in the background, which is not UI. And then there are less privileged parts, which are the renderer process. So this is the Chromium part. And it's basically just like your normal website. Um, it cannot really access directly the file system, execute commands, or whatever. It's just rendering the UI. And this is how it looks. I'm sure many of you have seen it. And the big outer red part is called the workbench. This is basically the core UI of VS Code itself. It's served from the VS Code file protocol, which is a special protocol. We will see that later. And then, for example, an extension here, the Markdown preview extension, can also show some UI. And this will be in a web view, which is similar to an iframe, so it's kind of isolated. And it also comes from the VS Code web view protocol. So already there, you see that it's coming from different things. There are some isolation things going on. But uh, yeah, if, if one of the parts, for example, the extension wants to directly access the workbench, then this will not be allowed by the same origin policy, because they come from different origins. Uh, and yeah, this is something that comes from the web and also applies here. But of course, sometimes the different parts have to communicate. And for that, there are different uh, IPC interfaces. So between origins in the renderers, um, there's window.post message, which is a regular web message passing interface. And then if uh, a UI part, a renderer process, wants to talk to some of the utility processes, they can use message ports to talk directly there. Or if they want to talk to the main process, then there's the good old Electron way of using preload scripts and the context bridge. So of course, to hunt bugs and to find them, you probably want to debug VS Code because it's just easier to step through instead of having to put printf everywhere and recompile. So for the UI part, you can just use the Chromium developer tools like you know them from Chrome or any other Chromium-based browsers. And with that, you can uh, debug extension UI and also the Workbench UI. If you want to debug the backend part of extensions, you have to start VS Code with the dash dash inspect extensions flag, and then you can just attach uh, a Chrome DevTools instance and debug it normally. 
or the easiest way is just you use VS Code to debug VS Code. Uh, it's easy because they have pre-made launch configurations, so you just clone the repo, open it in VS Code, and then you will see in the launch configs tab that you can start different processes or everything together under debugging. All right, now that we roughly know how VS Code looks in the inside, tomorrow we'll start with the first attack surface, which is exposed network services. So uh, I think it's a bit generic. Like, it's something you would find in kind of any desktop application. Uh, but in the case of VS Code, it happened kind of a lot. Um, you may have services that start listening onto network. Um, you may start wanting to expose a development server um, to localhost. You may want to expose a server to everybody. You may want to expose a debugger, um, or just to communicate with other components on the system. And while you would, in theory, to be safe, you would rather use some OS IPC mechanisms. Uh, it's still JavaScript code, TypeScript code, and I think people developing VS Code extensions are maybe like web developers or not JS developers, but they are not likely to be um, system level developers. So they never really use OS IPC mechanisms. Uh, and in, in practice, even if you want to expose a debugger or local server, even a Unix socket could be enough, and it would be safer to not expose anything. Uh, because if you start exposing ports, even on localhost, uh, there may be a website when you browse, uh, they may start doing requests to these ports, and even if it's uh, listening only on localhost, you could do CSOF attacks, you could use web sockets to connect to the service. So listening only on localhost is not a good solution either. Uh, if you want some examples of CVs that were uh, in plugins, uh, there is one, one called Rainbow Fart, uh, which is supposed to play sound when you type keywords uh, on VS Code, which sounds silly, but still, they got 128,000 installs, so people are using this module. And Kirill Efimov from Sneak found that it would expose an HTTP port on port 17777. Um, and if you go on this page, you would be able, be able to upload a zip file to change the sounds it's playing when you type on VS Code and there would be a zip-based path traversal. So basically, you would browse on some random website online, and they would do a CSOF attack to force you to send a zip file exploiting the vulnerability on this page. And then you would be able to override any file on the local file system. So you would override the developer's .bash rc file, and you would be able to execute arbitrary command from here. Uh, there were also a more serious example in the core directly of VS Code. Uh, if you remember Paul told you, you can uh, use the dash dash inspect uh, option to expose an OGS debugger to the outside to debug VS Code. And it was enabled by default on VS Code at that point in 2019. And it was reported in Bentley by Taviso and PHRAAAA, um, kind of like at the same, I think, the same week or same month. And in this case, this debugger was started on a local host in a random port every time you would start VS Code. But it's a debugger. It's meant to change variables. It's meant to run code on your behalf. Um, so if you'd be able to reach out to this part, you would kind of gain RC easily. Uh, in practice, it's not so easy, because um, the way the Node.js debugger works, you first have to do an HTTP request to uh, find out kind of a magic value uh, with a WebSocket URL, and then you use WebSockets to connect to this, to this uh, destination. Uh, so you cannot just make a request to a local service, uh, to a local port, because it's not the same origin. Um, so you would have first use some DNS rebinding to access the service, get the WebSocket URL, and then since WebSockets are not subject to the same origin policy, you would be able to connect to this thing. Um, I don't remember seeing any complete exploit for it, but I think it could have been exploited uh, in, in that case. And now we can start to spice things up and dig into things that are more specific to VS Code in this case. Um, another very interesting feature of Electron is that it provides a native layer um, to work uh, with the underlying operating system for like a better integration. Um, so you also need it because you need file access, network access, but you can also expose things to the outside. Uh, for, it's a pretty nice form of IPC that's not relying on the network. So VS Code registers is VS Code colon slash slash uh, protocol handler. And if you have a VS Code Insider, which is an IQ version of VS Code, it's VS Code dash insiders colon slash slash. And uh, when you click on one of these links, the OS kind of gets uh, the event and says, OK, do I have anybody who kind of registered for this one? In the case of VS Code, it's going to be VS Code. And it kind of wakes up VS Code and says, oh, there is something for you. And um, so this is one of the bugs that we found in the Git built-in extension. So it's called an extension, but it's built-in, enabled by default, and you cannot remove it. It's part of VS Code, but it's still called an extension. And uh, it, it exposes a feature that way to, alert, to let you clone repositories when you click on a link. So uh, when you use GitLab, for instance, when you want to clone something, it gives you the command line with uh, git clone, and you can also have this uh, open in your ID button 
uh, that will automatically bring VS Code uh, in front and clone the repo for you. So under the hood, the way it works, um, um, the Git extension uh, implements a class called UI handler, and it kind of handles the request that comes from the operating system. If it finishes with slash clone, it, co it calls, a uh, calls a method called clone with uh, the full address that you clicked. And then it passes URL and calls uh, ID command called git got, git got clone, uh, which is uh, something you can also invoke yourself when you press uh, command shift and P. Uh, you can also type git clone and it's going to run the same thing. And then inter internally git clone uh, calls something called clone repository, uh, which is only a wrapper around the git command. There is no reason to re-implement git in, in TypeScript just for this feature. So they simply call git clone for you. And as you see in the web square, um, if there is no space, it puts the URL as is right here. So um, there is something interesting here because we kind of control uh, the way an external command is being called, and there is no risk of command injection here because it's not being executed in the shell. It's directly calling Git, uh, but you can still add arbitrary arguments to Git. So you, if you put Git um, dash dash help, it's going to display the help. And in this case, it's a Git clone. So the, the green part is what's fixed, what's uh, constant uh, because of VS Code, and in red is what we control. And we found out that if you put the option dash u for your upload pack, it's going to um, tell Git to, next time you have to clone something, uh, use this command instead of trying to use your own commands. So basically, it tricks Git into running a command of your choice instead. There are some restrictions for exploitation, which are not that interesting, but it's kind of like CTFE. Uh, you need the colon to trigger this command, uh, because otherwise Git thinks it's a local repo, it's not a remote one, and it's not calling the upload pack command. And you need to avoid spaces to not be well encoded. So this is what the final uh, payload looks like. We have this VS Code colon slash slash thing, VS Code Git, clone, we pass the URL, dash u, and then we do some tricks uh, to not have spaces. And the resulting invocation is this git clone dash u thing. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in practice. And let's say you go online on some uh, GitLab uh, self hosted instance. You want to use this feature. So you're going to clone. You click, I want to open it in my VS Code. It prompts you that you want to clone. There is no way for me to check what's, what's in there. So I have to trust it. So I'm going to say yes. Um, I put it on my desktop. All right. And once again, we have this calc that just popped up. Um, so yeah, kind of unsafe in the end. And there were a very similar finding, um, I think, uh, a year before by Smurry from Childer. Um, also an argument injection when you would click on links for the remote um, development extension. Uh, I am not showing code because it's closed source and we didn't like spend time to dig into it and uh, make it readable, but it's basically the same thing. Like the host part is directly being put in the command line and you can inject arbitrary arguments. And uh, you would exploit it with dash o proxy command. And it's quick ad break. Uh, I love argument injection bugs. I think, Paul, uh, you're getting used to it. Uh, and we found many, many argument injection bugs over the time. So we created a page that lists all the small dash u, dash o proxy command, all these argument injection vectors that's going to help you to execute arbitrary commands when you find argument injection bugs. So it's free, it's open source, and it welcomes contribution. So if you uh, go on this page and you find out that we missed uh, good tricks, uh, feel free to add yours. And now we can also dig into something that's even more specific to VS Code, and that's uh, workspace settings. Uh, there is a support for pair workspace settings um, that comes along uh, your source code repo. So if you want to share settings with other developers, like linter configurations, um, like things to do and you want to share with everybody else, you can create a, for an, a file named .vscode slash settings.json, and uh, it's a way to share the settings, and it's automatically loaded uh, when you open the folder. So the question is, if you put your security research hat on, maybe can I op override sensitive settings? Like, are there maybe sensitive settings? And uh, in 2017, so like a long time ago, uh, Justin Steven found out that there would be an option called git.pass, also from the git's built-in extension, uh, that you could change to say, oh, no, git, it's not in my slash user slash bin slash git. It's somewhere else. Um, so if you ship a folder, a project, uh, and in settings you override this setting, the git.pass thing, you could force it to invoke other commands instead. And, it, and as soon as somebody would open a folder, it would be loaded, and git would run, and it would call this other command instead. Um, there were also some interesting tricks for the exploitation, because it would have to survive a first 
command dash dash version invocation from the VS Code install folder, and then it would be called from the project folder. So what it did it was to set git dot pass to bash, so the first call works, and for the other one he would plant a file called ref pass in this folder, and it would be called instead, and we would run its payload. And there was also another uh, example of vulnerabilities that would use local data uh, directly found by Didi Walker in 2020. Um, when you do um, not just uh, development, you would use npm to, st to store all your dependencies. And um, to this end, you write everything in a file named package.json. And if you kind of over a dependency on this file, uh, the, NPM, um, the NPM plugin uh, kicks in and tries to fetch information and to show you information like the description of the package, how many installs, everything. And uh, it would call this command and, and safely concatenate the name of a dependency in the command, and there would be a command injection in there. Um, it was later bypassed by Justin Steven again uh, because they started to try to fix it. They started validating the name of the dependencies, and it's a fail open thing. So basically, if you don't match what they expect you to be something unsafe, it would say, yeah, it's safe. It's like uh, it's a block list approach instead of an error list approach, and it's, uh, it was once again proven to be uh, not the best way to fix the vulnerabilities. And uh, now we can get to Workspace Trust, which was also part of the name of, of this talk, so we have to explain it to you. Um, it was a feature introduced in 2021 in VS Code that was go its goal is to reduce the impact of malicious folders. So everything you've seen before where we would run arbitrary commands and where we would use local data could be kind of um, blocked by this uh, new trust-based system. And you would have a new security assumption. You would say all untrusted folders are safe to open in restricted mode, but as soon as you start trusting something, it's not a security bug anymore if somebody executes commands in this case. Uh, so trusting a folder is always unsafe, and untrusted folder is supposed to be safe. And this is what it looks like. So this is a prompt that says, do you trust the authors of this file in this folder? Uh, and it pops every time you open a folder. So you may be influenced and say, oh, I want to click yes every single time, but it's maybe not the best idea. Um, there are some documentation that say, this is what, what you risk if you press yes, uh, but you would not expect the no to be unsafe. And the way it works under the hood, uh, all extensions, including built-in ones, they declare their own capabilities in their own package.json file, and the default value is false. That means this extension won't run in, ex in untrusted workspaces. Um, so you kind of miss features from VS Code just because you clicked, no, I don't trust. So you're not kind of like living the life with VS Code with all the fancy extensions, and you have a very limited IDE, which is maybe not what you were looking for in the first place. Um, so they also introduced something called limited uh, that lets extension say, okay, in this case, if it's untrusted, I'm not going to run this command. Uh, I'm going to remove a few of my features that could be unsafe, but everything else will run. And once again, the guilt built an extension, I think it's really a gift for us. Um, it runs in untrusted workspaces. It says it's supported, so that means it's going to run uh, in all untrusted workspaces and untrusted trusted workspaces also. And um, when we were trying to see if there were security issues with this extension, uh, we found out that Git, so the command Git, supports several levels of configuration. Uh, there is a system-wide configuration in etc git config, there is a global one in your own folder in .git config, and there is a local one in .git slash config of the current folder. Um, indeed, but yeah, cloning does not retrieve the local configuration, um, nor the other kind of configuration. Is, uh, they have to be files you created yourself on your system, uh, but you can put Git repos in archives, so it would come with its own local configuration that may be unsafe. And uh, Justin Steven um, and, and us, we collided on some research where we tried to, to see if we would be able to kind of hide Git repositories um, in some folders of Git repositories, so we would be able to clone these uh, files uh, when you clone the main repository. And in a git config, you can have uh, interesting directives, so like the one we have here, which is called .fs monitor, which is a way to, to tell Git, please run this command to see if there were some changes since the last time you ran this command. Uh, the default one is really good, but if you have a, like, a huge monorepo, if you have a thousand of files, it's going to take some time to find out the differences, so sometimes you may want something more specific uh, for better performance and not, not like in the IDE or when you get in your developer shell. So it's not specific to VS Code, and we found out that uh, basically planting malicious configuration in Git folders, uh, it's pretty easy to trick people into opening these folders uh, and to force them to execute arbitrary commands. And in fact, the first demonstration we've, we've shown in the intro was based on a malicious Git folder that could have been just a zip file or a sub-command, uh, a sub-repo. 
Um, so this is was a command which was a calc, and we have the workspace trust thing, because the Git extension runs in trusted workspaces. It runs before the prompt displays to, to the user, so you have no way to prevent everything. You cannot just review every single Git repo that you're cloning or that you're downloading from the internet. And to show you some uh, side thing that we found, uh, so we told you it worked in VS Code, but it also works in developer shells. So let's. In this case, I have uh, ZSH with the all my ZSH team that includes a Git uh, extension to show in my shell uh, on which branch I'm running and uh, give me some contextualized information on my Git repo. Uh, so it runs every time I CD in a new directory. So if I go on the desktop uh, and then I go on my malicious Git repo, it's going to pop again. So even CDing into something that runs Git in a directory and having something that runs Git on my behalf it's unsafe. So in the end, all these developer tools, they don't really kind of acknowledge the security risks, and they say, oh, yeah, it's up to you to not run, to not work with malicious Git repos, but you can't just review everything by yourself every single time. Um, so there are a lot of things out there that are still affected by this thing, like the OMS of this age prompt, um, and we've also reported it to many IDEs, many uh, shell integrations. Some of them try to fix it, but in the end, it should be on Git to fix it. And they said, no, it's an accepted risk. You should not work with untrusted Git repos. So now Paul's going to show you a few things about XSSs in VS Code. Yes. So as I told you earlier, VS Code has a built-in browser. Part of it is Chromium. So of course, there can be cross-site scripting. And in an IDE like VS Code, XSS bugs can be very nasty because uh, some parts of the UI always have to be kind of privileged. Uh, I showed you the, the red part, the workbench. You will have buttons like save file or run my build command. And if you press that button in the UI, that should happen. So the UI has to have a way to make this happen. And the other thing is that extensions can have their own UI part in web views, as I showed you for the Markdown preview extension. And even if we would say, OK, all the code of VS Code itself is clean, no issues, no security vulnerabilities, all the extensions that you install from the marketplace uh, could still have something. And that's then the first foot in the door to start your XSS attack. So let's look at the first example. Uh, this is a cool one. It was found uh, by the Grand Pew and Sirius of Electrovolt. They presented it here at DEF CON last year, so we will go quickly over it. Basically, they found a way to control the content of, uh, of an extension's web view, uh, in this case, the Markdown preview extension. And then they used a meta HTML tag to redirect away. So basically, now their attacker page is running in this web view, in this frame. Uh, and from there, they can start their attack. So they already took control over the frame, over the web view. And then they used the post message message passing interface to talk to the outer part, to the workbench. And there was an unsafe handler that allowed them to load any file in that privileged frame. But there was a clue. They can't just load their own file and from the attacker server and run any code on the system. They had to find a way to actually load the file via the correct origin, via the correct protocol. And they found a bug in VS Code itself. So they could do that. And after that, the, they could use the node integration, which is an electron setting, basically, that says, OK, this origin can just use the Node.js APIs to run commands and so on. Um, then there was a pretty similar finding, this time by Justin Steven. He found that in the Jupyter Notebook extension, you can also render certain things as Markdown. And then it's the same thing over again. You can put some HTML. And first of all, he only found how to leak arbitrary files, because there's this fun CDN uh, origin that's a special one. And yes, the plus uh, in there in the domain name is not a uh, mistake. Um, and you can basically put an absolute path and yeah, read any file by just loading it. And then Luca Cratoni by Doyensec um, used it to improve it to an RCE, basically by using the same last stage as the other guys uh, to yeah, co uh, compromise the privileged origin. And then there was a pretty different finding. This was by Zemmes of Google, and they uh, also used the uh, Jupyter Python notebook markdown trick to render something from there as markdown. 
but they didn't have to go up this chain to first compromise the privileged origin and then use the node integration. They found a way to, a way to go around that, which is they just created a link tag with a command link with the, from the command protocol. And this is a special one in VS Code. So this allows you to execute internal VS Code commands. So not an OS command, but basically something like, okay, focus the taskbar or open the terminal. And in this case, they auto-clicked this link with JavaScript, so the, the command would be executed. And they used the command that opens a new terminal, because with that you can specify which shell executable and which arguments to execute. And that gives you direct arbitrary code execution. And from this, we noticed a lot of the UI of VS Code is actually marked down. Uh, the tooltips, the status bar at the bottom, the menus, a lot of things are just marked on strings being rendered because it's easier than writing HTML, I guess. Uh, and if there's user or attacker control data being interpolated into this markdown, then markdown injection can happen. And if that happens, and in the place of the code, the markdown string is set to being trusted, then you can use these command links in Markdown as well. So if you have Markdown injection, you can just put in a link uh, to, again, use this command to open a terminal with your own command, basically. Uh, but it always requires user interaction, because the user still has to click on the link. It can't be auto-clicked unless you have JavaScript execution in the first place. So with that in mind, we looked at some third-party extensions, for example, GitLens. This is an extension with 25 million installs. It's pretty common and pre pretty popular. And there we found that uh, while they rendered some hover tooltips for some commits, uh, we could inject markdown. Uh, and in this case, the data came from a commit message, and it was then unsafely interpolated into a markdown string, where we could then add, an, add a link. And in this case, we didn't use the other one, because we also wanted it to work in untrusted workspace to, again, bypass this workspace trust prompt. So we use the install extension command. And because the marketplace is open, I can just publish any extension there. Uh, you could publish a malice, malicious extension and then use this command to install it at the victim's VS Code instance. And this was fixed pretty, pretty quickly in version 14. CV is still pending, but it's a first good example. And this is basically how it looks like. So you open a some, some repo, and you can see the blue bar on top, so it's still in the untrusted mode. But if you hover a line and then click on this very innocent looking uh, message, then a calc pops showing that we could have executed any command. And we found a similar thing in the GitHub pull requests and issues extension, which has 13 million installs, so also pretty popular. It's uh, by GitHub themselves. And again, in a hover tooltip, we found a markdown. Uh, injection. And in this case, it didn't come from the local repository or the local workspace folder, but it can be exploited remotely, which means, let's say, a maintainer is working on that project. They use this extension to look at issues and PRs. And then I, as an attacker, create a malicious PR, which has the pay exploit payload in the body. And if they then use the extension to look at it, again, we have the markdown injection. If they click the link, it's GG. So this one was also fixed pretty soon. CV is also pending. And this is what it looks like. So first, we create this, again, very important looking uh, issue on GitHub on some maintainer's project. Then if they use the extension to look at this, again, there's a very innocent link. And if they click on it, a calculator opens. So yeah, this was basically the last of our attack surfaces. As we've seen, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. So let's see how things went when we were reporting the bugs that we found to Microsoft. Um, so we used the office, official MSRC uh, platform for that. Um, it's pretty cool f uh, compared to bug bounty platforms because it allows you to speak about the bugs after you, they were fixed, which we would like to do. Uh, for some people, it has a little bit bad reputation because of delays. Uh, but for us personally, we had a good experience. No, not many delays. And uh, it's a nice thing because everything is centralized there, even the attribution. And you can always see, oh, it's in development. It's being released soon. So you don't have to wait without a response from the vendor for months. 
Um, so let's look at the bounties we got. So for the first one, which was the git local level configuration bug, we got a 30k bounty, which was pretty cool. We donated it to charity and uh, we even wondered a little bit why it was so much because yeah, we didn't know and it fell into the Azure uh, bug bounty and we even asked them why it's so much. Do they have a hosted VS Code version somewhere? But we never got a response. So the year after, we found something again, which was this time the protocol handler argument injection. And we thought, OK, easy. We get another 30K, which we can give to charity. Pretty cool. But the response was, oh, wait a minute. Last time, we awarded you the bug bounty in, uh, in error. And actually, all extensions, including the built-in ones that are shipped with VS Code, are out of scope. Sorry, this time, you're not getting any bounty. Um, and yeah. we. We kind of disagree. We, we think extensions that are built in and shipped with it uh, should be in scope for bug bounty, but at least they still fix it, right? And this even brought us onto the MSRC leaderboard in Q2 last year, and the things that I showed in GitLens and the uh, GitHub extension brought us on the leaderboard this year, which was pretty cool because we could go to the Microsoft researcher invite-only party uh, yesterday. <laughs> All right, so now let's wrap things up. Uh, we've seen a lot. So the first things that we learned is that CVEs hint at buggy components. Um, a lot of the fixed vulnerabilities were bypassed by Justin Steven because he just looked at the patch and saw that it's not complete. Uh, and that's probably, it will probably be the same case in the future. So if you want to find some easy bugs, just look at what they fix and see if the patch is complete. The next thing we want you to remember is if you click trust, you lose. Um, for example, the git local configuration exploit still works if you trust the workspace because the way git works and it's basically not really possible for VS Code to fix it. And they also say if you trust, it's your problem now. Uh, we want you. So don't ple please don't click on trust just to get away, uh, to, to get this dialogue that nags you uh, away. Uh, think about it, and uh, if you don't trust it, press I don't trust it. And then we found that attacking desktop applications is fun, and it's a lot different compared to attacking server applications that you can reach over the internet, because it has a whole new set of assumptions and attack surfaces. And we've also seen that bug bounty scope doesn't always reflect the real threat model. Um, again, we think that built-in modules should not be excluded from the bug bounty scope. But uh, yeah, we can change that. And finally, um, yeah, it's still unclear for many developer tools uh, what's the security threat model. Uh, they're not built with security in mind. It's not super clear what's the responsibility of the user and what's the responsibility of the tool to make sure everything is safe, no random commands are executed. And if you don't know that it's your job as a user, then you can't really yeah, protect yourself. Uh, we personally like the principle of least surprise, so we think the tool should not do some magic under the hood that you don't know will happen. Uh, so, yeah, it should warn you, and that's why we think the workspace trust that was added is a well, very welcome addition and a good start, and we hope other developer tools will include it as well. Thank you.